Well, let's talk about retro versus the real thing. If you're interested in getting a motorcycle in the retro category, or maybe we're thinking about picking up a vintage bike, I'd like to talk to you today about some of the differences and things that you're going to encounter with going either route. As I have both, and I can speak to both categories. So this is my 1964 Royal Enfield Interceptor, and as most of you know, you can buy a new Royal Enfield Interceptor that looks pretty much the same, but it's going to be a distinctly different experience. So what is the big pluses and minuses to going either way? All right. Well, the vintage bike is going to have that indefinable thing called character. I mean, it really does. These things all are very individual in how they feel, how they ride, how they sit, you know, the ergonomics, and so forth. One of the things that is good about a real antique motorcycle is it's probably not ever going to go down in value. It's only going to go up. So if you buy it today, you can ride it for 5, 10, 15 years and easily get your money back out of it if you buy wisely. I try to buy motorcycles for the purposes of riding them. I don't buy fully restored beauty queens, nor do I with cars anymore, because I don't enjoy primping and polishing and taking care of the cosmetics. It's just not something that brings me any pleasure. It's just drudgery. So I try to buy a really nice, you know, rider quality bike, and this one was that. Um, it's not an original color, so it's already hurt its value a little bit there. But it was a low mileage, stored indoors, reasonably, you know, good condition bike when I got it, other than the fact that it didn't run, <laughs> which I don't probably recommend a beginner gets a bike that doesn't run, unless you're, you know, really mechanically inclined, as I tend to be. So there's, a, there's the value factor, and you're going to spend probably the same amount buying a antique motorcycle in many cases as you will on a good newer retro bike, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. But uh, the, one of the problems, of course, with these is you're likely not going to be able to test ride the bike or the style of bike you're looking at. Um, in advance of purchasing one. So you, most of the time, unless you've ridden one of these in your past history, you're not going to have that opportunity to figure out what it's like. Now, uh, one thing I can suggest is there is a uh, quote-unquote company called Retro Tours that runs out of eastern Pennsylvania here, kind of close to where I am, and it's actually a a private guy who uh, started a little business of taking people on tours on vintage motorcycles because he has quite the collection. And uh, that is an excellent way to decide if vintage bikes are even for you at all. And you'll be able to try out multiple bikes on a weekend tour because you get to switch off and on throughout the tour and ride different ones. So look him up. I'll try to remember to put the link in the uh, description below. But uh, Joel at Retro Tours, great guy. Has a collection of a little bit of everything. He's got Japanese, British, Italian bikes, and uh, even a random Harley thrown in just for good measure. Um, and usually has at least one or two BMWs, too. So any of those kinds of bikes from the late 60s into the 70s and maybe into the early 80s if you wanted to try you can uh, contact Joel and schedule a day or a weekend trip he does private tours as well as group tours and uh, he'll hook you up pretty pretty easy to do just show up and, and start riding and that's kind of how I figured out I wanted an antique motorcycle of my own uh, rode a whole bunch of different things down there I've been on multiple retro tours and uh, found out what I liked and what I didn't like. And uh, I gravitate towards British bikes just because I, number one, like the looks of them a lot better than the others. And two, they just give me a uh, riding experience that I find really pleasurable. So uh, you have, of course, choices of different brands. And it's going to matter as to you know, what you like as far as the personality of the bike and or the styling. And I have opinions about different brands and 
so forth. And I'm not going to tell you which ones I think are good or bad or whatever, because everybody's flavors are different. I got into Royal Enfields kind of by accident because I bought my bullet as a project several years ago and just really uh, fell in love with the engineering and the design of that bike. And so decided that when I got a twin, I was going to get a Royal Enfield if I could, because I was kind of familiar with the bike in many ways other than the engine. And it's proven to be a, a pretty good plan. Um, when you're shopping these antique bikes, you want to try to figure out if there's ones that you like, what is the support like for that bike? Um, Royal Enfields are really easy for the most part. Uh, Hitchcock's Motorcycles in the UK offers just about any part that you could want. Um, they're reproducing stuff all the time. The prices are reasonable. The shipping is super fast here to the US. And I have nothing but good things to say about them. They've made the Royal Enfield ownership experience absolutely pain-free for the most part. So that's a great bonus. Um, you know, bikes like Triumphs and Nortons, you're not going to have any trouble really getting parts for those either. In most cases, Baxter Cycle here in the U.S. is a good source of parts for those. Uh, some of the other brands, um, when you get into starting with maybe BSA and then going down to Matchless and AJS and Velset, then you're going to start to find that things are going to be a little bit more difficult. Um, Italian bikes are... Probably going to be much more difficult, except maybe for Moto Guzzi. Uh, Japanese bikes you would think would be easy, but they're actually not. <laughs> Depends on the model, but some parts for those can be very difficult to come up with. As a lot of those aren't being reproduced, so you have to try to find the new old stock stuff. The riding experience on these is, as I said, full of character, but it also has its downsides. And these are things that you're going to be wanting to know about. First, of course, is that pretty much every antique motorcycle um, up into the 70s uh, with an invasion of the Japanese bikes is going to be kickstart only. And when these bikes are properly set up and tuned correctly, Starting them is generally not too difficult, generally. <laughs> On a really smoking hot, humid day, um, sometimes British bikes can be very recalcitrant. And cold starts on these bikes, every bike seems to have its own little wacky procedure that it likes. Um, this bike is my most difficult one to, to, to start when it's cold, just because it never really seems to want the same thing twice. When it's warm, one or two kicks, no problem. The bullet uh, starts perfectly the same every time when it's cold and warm as well. So again, it, each bike's an individual. Um, shifting, especially, I'm going to be talking mostly about British bikes here, so your, your mileage may vary depending on what you're looking at. But um, British bikes, shifter, going to be on the right side instead of the normal left configuration up into the mid 70s. So going back and forth between modern and old is kind of a brain fart situation. You be stabbing that shifter trying to apply the rear brake and nothing's happening <laughs> except some ugly downshifts. And then of course the brake is gonna be on the opposite side. Now, the hand controls are the same. Clutch on the left, brake on the right, no problems there, throttle. On the right grip but the brake and clutch for your foot are going to be backwards in most cases additionally Norton's and Enfield's also have the shifting pattern ass backwards first is up instead of down and that can be uh, entertaining to remember as well all part of the charm right the other thing is the brakes on these old bikes while a lot of people complain about them, and I think to excess, the brakes are adequate. Um, some are better than others. A lot of it has to do with the brakes being properly set up and adjusted. And if you don't have them right, it's like they're not even there. But if you get them set properly, like the one on the front of my bullet is a little finicky to get there. But once you get it, it's actually pretty decent. 
um, for one or two good stops. <laughs> if you're going to be going down a lot of big hills, um, you're going to want to rely on engine braking because the brakes will get hot and then they will not want to work. But uh, overall, I really don't complain. I think these bikes have brakes that are adequate for their performance in their day on the roads that they were designed to be ridden on. In today's traffic, you don't want to ride these the same as you do a modern motorcycle. They're not going to stop as well. All of these bikes are going to have carburetors. I like carburetors. I understand them. And I actually enjoy working on them. A lot of people do not and will curse their existence. So if you are not prepared to tinker with and rebuild and tune carburetors, an older bike is probably not for you. Now, these Amel carburetors are reproduced. You can get brand new ones that are actually made of better materials than the originals are. So if you are having problems and don't want to fuss with these things, if you got worn slides or whatever, you can just order new ones. No big deal. These bikes will require a lot of mechanical interaction. If you're not a tinkerer, if you don't like to pull tools out of the toolbox, probably shouldn't have an antique motorcycle. I'm not saying they're unreliable, and I'm not saying that you have to work on them all the time, but stuff will break, things will leak. More about that in a second. And of course, you have to adjust the valves and so on. And the nice thing about these old bikes is the valve adjustments are usually pretty easy. It's just a screw and nut on most of these things. So all you have to do is pop some covers off, get in there with your feeler gauge, do the adjustments, boom, it doesn't take very long. Modern motorcycles, different story entirely. If you can't work on these yourself, you'd best have a good antique motorcycle mechanic nearby. And those are not easy to find, and a lot of those guys are retiring and closing up shop, I'm finding. So you're kind of on your own, with the help of the internet, to do a lot of stuff on these bikes. As far as handling goes and the riding experience, I think these are mostly fine. Um, they're not going to be the greatest corner carvers out there. For example, this bike and a lot of the British bikes of this period have rigidly mounted pegs. Newer bikes, of course, have pegs that if you hit the pavement, they just move, right? No problem. You start scraping pegs on one of these, you're going to have a bad day. So you got to be cognizant of that. Lighting, terrible um, and frequently non-functional because, <laughs> hey, it's got that name on it, right? One of the things you can do, and what I've done with this bike, is replace the standard bulb with a LED, and that has made a huge difference. Um, this bike only has a 6-volt charging system, so it's already kind of limited as to the output it's going to give you. And that LED light has completely transformed the illumination um, so that other people can actually see me coming now, instead of a dim candle flicker coming in their general direction. I don't ride bikes after dark, generally speaking, and certainly don't bother riding after dark on these antiques, so I can't really tell you how much better it is in that regard, but daytime uh, appearance is, of course, much better. Now, another thing with regards to lighting, this one does not have turn signals. Motorcycles did not have turn signals standard back in the day, up until the 1970s, I believe. Um, you can add them should you desire to, it is possible. But I've chosen to leave this one alone as is because I like to look better. So that requires you to give hand signals to indicate your various left and right turns. Keeping in mind that the general population has no idea what the hell you're doing moving your arm around and pointing. So you have to be very, very careful when people are behind you. Um, the brake lights on these are very small. Again, you can put an LED light bulb in that to help you out. But that is safety aspect you really have to be cognizant of. If you're riding uh, around town or in populated areas with a lot of traffic, um, definitely requires a lot of care and careful attention. I don't ride very many roads with this bike that are 
much with the way of traffic, so it's very easy for me to just ride and be out there by myself. It's a good thing. Comfort level is not bad. Um, all these old bikes are going to have vibrations. I find these seats that are long and flat like this very easy to move around on. You get a comfy spot. You can stretch your legs a little bit. Um, no problem at all. Vibration wise it's going to vary from bike to bike. Some are going to vibrate more than others. This bike is dynamically balanced in the engine. Royal Enfield did that on these 750 Twins, and so they're not bad at all. They actually have kind of a pleasant, um, almost a massage in your tushy kind of vibration. But you're still going to get vibrations in the bars and the pegs uh, on any of these older type bikes. If you have issues with arthritis or things like that, um, this may cause flare-ups and discomfort as you ride. So if you're of an older age as I'm approaching, then that can be a consideration also. Also, these old bikes generally did not have rear view mirrors. I had to add this one. I was riding without one for quite a while and I just couldn't cope anymore. So I had to add that goofy thing on there. Don't, don't like it at all, but uh, again, I have these to ride, not just look at. So those are the pluses and minuses kind of of the vintage motorcycle thing. And I'll take you now and we'll talk about the new retro type motorcycle and how that compares. All right, welcome to the rec room of the house and where I keep a couple bikes. Now that I have my lovely French doors that I can wheel them in and out of. Uh, we'll start with a, just a brief comment here on the bullet and this style of motorcycle that you might consider. Um, these are out there if you're looking at a bike from, you know, Royal Enfield in the 70s, 80s up through the 2000s. You're going to be able to find these bullets and these are a modernly built version of an antique motorcycle. In other words, what you're looking at here is a 1955 motorcycle that just happened to be built in 2007. So it's going to have all the foibles and shortcomings of the old bike and almost none of the advantages of the new bike. Um, some of the electrical stuff and switches and things like that are a little bit more modern and arguably better. But um, other than that, you're riding a 1955 motorcycle with its inherent shortcomings. We didn't talk about oil leaks, and we probably should. Antique motorcycles, unless they're Japanese, are probably going to uh, sweat power, as they say. And if you do a full rebuild and restoration on a bike, it is possible with modern gaskets and sealing materials and technology to get these to be pretty much oil tight. If you have not done a complete rebuild restoration on the engine, that chance. <laughs> My experience is they're going to weep somewhere and all the time. Um, they just weren't designed to be oil tight. That's all I can say. Um, I'm sure people in the comments will argue that, oh, I have a Triumph and it doesn't leak a drop of oil. And Okay, yeah, but I'm sure that engine's been apart and put back together properly with modern materials. So, Except the fact that it's going to drip oil from somewhere at some point. From either the engine, the primary, or the transmission. <laughs> it's just the way it is. This bike actually is fairly oil tight. And that tray is almost not necessary. But uh, this one drips a little bit from the primary side usually. The interceptor that I just showed you um, had some engine oil leaks that I fixed twice now and they seem to be holding but the tack drive keeps leaking and I've decided to just call it charming. So now we'll move to the modern modern motorcycle, the true retro classic and this is a 2008 Triumph Bonneville. This is the last of the carbureted models so anything after 08, 09 is going to be fuel injected and you won't have that issue with carbs if you're scared of carburetors. But then what you do have is fuel injection and all the electronics that go with it. So win some, lose some, right? Okay, so advantages here. Well, 
there's one major advantage to these modern retro bikes. And that is the little button down there that you hit to start the bike. Electric starting makes everybody's life easier. Until it doesn't work. <laughs> so, I did have an instance where this one left me sit one day because the battery had decided it was going to take a dump. Um, really not the fault of the bike, it's just one of those things that happens. But when that happens, you're not going to be able to start the machine. Um, bump starting it just doesn't work because it still has electronic ignition and if there's not enough juice for that to function, the ignition's not going to fire. What do you have with this is modern brakes, big old discs, both front and rear. You've got proper shifting, shifter on the left, brake on the right. Usually the clutch action is a little bit easier, sometimes it's even hydraulic. You're going to have hydraulic brakes, of course, where the older ones are going to be cable operated. You've got turn signals. You've got rear view mirrors. You still have a nice, mostly flat, comfortable seat. You have no oil leaks. I mean, you can develop, but you can fix those very easily. Modern charging system. Modern lighting. Much easier to own. Get on it, hit the starter, off you go. No choking, well, except for this one. <laughs> but generally speaking, with fuel injection, no choking, no timing, advancing, no points, no magnetos with points, none of that stuff. It's just push a button and go. Very easy. Is the riding experience the same? Well, yes and no. It is kind of the same, at least on these air-cooled Bonnevilles. Uh, you do get some vibration. Not an unpleasant vibration, but you do get some. Um, the shifting is, is very mechanical feeling. It, uh, it handles decent, but not sport bike-ish. The brakes are good, not outstanding, but better than the older bikes. The biggest problem with these is that they're heavy. There's a big weight difference between this bike, 865-ish cc's, and the Royal Enfield Interceptor that I showed you earlier, which is 750 cc's. This bike here, I don't remember the exact weight, but it's pretty close to 500 pounds. I mean, it's only just, just under. Whereas that Interceptor is probably more in the low, mid fours. Probably a 430, somewhere in there, I'm guessing. I should have looked these up, I apologize. But you can definitely feel the difference, both on the bike and in moving it around. Getting this Bonneville on and off the stand and in and out of this rec room is effort. And it is a very heavy bike that is very easy to drop. Don't ask me how I know. <laughs> uh, so if you're not a very strong person, or you're a very short person, you might have some trouble managing this. Now, there are obviously other brands and alternatives that are a little easier to, to use. I think the Royal Enfield Interceptor that they make now is, is a lighter bike and easier to use than this. The, uh, the newer water-cold ones are going to be probably about the same. The experience riding those, I have a video where I talk about that, is much different. The new water-cold models are very Honda-ish. They're almost too refined, in my opinion, to be a retro bike. It's kind of taken all of the character out of the bike and just made it a very efficient, very perfect motorcycle. If that's what you're used to, you'll probably love it. But if you like bikes that are a little vibey and have a little bit of character to them and a little personality, I think these air-cooled ones are going to be much better than the water-cooled ones. Now, these are a relative bargain. Um, you can buy these 
air-cooled bonnies all day long from anywhere from probably 3500 bucks up to five, 6000 And they're everywhere. And they're almost bulletproof. There's really nothing that goes wrong with these. So you really don't have to worry too much about buying a used one. A true antique motorcycle, on the other hand, is going to be at least the same price in most cases. A vintage Triumph, uh, you know, you can buy an oil and frame Triumph, which is a good bike to ride. It's just not the prettiest. Those are, you know, $4,500, $5,500. Bucks. You can find those all over the place in, in good riding condition. Um, you want an older bike like a 60s Bonneville that this kind of mimics here, that's going to set you back maybe seven, eight grand at current market. Um, and they're going up all the time. So by the time you, you watch this, depending on what it is, you know, those prices may be completely out of, out of whack. Um, Norton's I'm seeing up to, you know, eight to 10 grand now. That Royal Enfield Interceptor I have, I bought non-running for around 4,500. And it's probably worth six to seven the way it is right now. So if that gives you an idea. So anything that you want in either category, unless you're buying brand new, you can easily get for under 10,000 bucks. If all you're looking at is rider quality. If you want fully restored and a, you know, a beautiful trailer queen to put in your rec room, <laughs> um, that's a different story and I don't get into those bikes. These bullets, if you're interested in something like that, an interim motorcycle that is neither old nor new, um, these can be picked up for 3,500, 2,500 even, if you shop long and long and hard enough. That's a whole different market, maybe another video. So, which would I recommend? Well, it depends, really, it depends on your tastes and if you have mechanical skills. I really would not recommend the genuine antique motorcycle to someone who does not have the ability to work on it. Again, I'm not saying that they're unreliable. I haven't had any real bad experiences with any of my bikes leaving me sit. But you are going to have to fix things from time to time to keep things from getting worse. Currently, the interceptor has a bad speedometer cable. Why is that? Well, because the speedometer seems to be binding up and it's snapping cables and costing me $35 every time that happens. <laughs> so it's time to send the speedo out. The tachometer has decided it wants to bounce all over the place, even with a new cable. So that needs to be fixed. Both of the gauges are going to have to go out, spend a couple hundred dollars a piece getting those repaired most likely. The cost of repairing them it's kind of hard to judge because these newer bikes like this Bonneville, you rarely have to repair. The few parts that I've had to buy for it have not been terribly expensive. And you can of course modify and customize these any way you want without catching the ire of the purists like you would if you started to change things and even hack up an original antique motorcycle. So, that's kind of the deciding factor. Can you work on it yourself? Because if you can't, I think your ownership experience is going to be much, much more difficult unless you have that reliable local antique bike mechanic that's going to be able to work on your bike and keep it running for you. Otherwise, go the retro route, which is the bike I bought first because I wasn't sure I wanted the antique motorcycle experience. I then bought the bullet, put it back together, got it running and enjoyed it so much. I bought the Interceptor and have kept my eyes open now even for something else to, to add to the collection. And that's kind of how it happens. The other danger is when you buy one, usually you buy more than, than that over time because they're so appealing. And they are generally very easy to work on. Any of these brands are simple, made to be serviced, not difficult for most people with any kind of mechanical skills. The newer ones, they're also not bad to work on, but usually stuff's packed in tighter, more electronics, not able to diagnose things maybe at home. Things to think about there. I hope this was helpful to you. If it was, please let me know. If you thought it was terrible, let me know that too. As always, I thank you for watching. Subscribe if you want. And I look forward to seeing you again soon.